Hidden in plain sight all over the archipelago of Great Britain are monuments and earthworks that were constructed by our ancient ancestors back in antiquity. These places on the landscape were clearly held in high regard by those Neolithic farmers who would settle on the islands of Britain around 6,000 years ago. These monuments ask more questions than we could ever hope to answer. These include stone henges, stone circles, causewayed enclosures and long barrows where Neolithic people would bury their dead. These are but a few of the mysterious monuments we find throughout this ancient land. At this location, very near to the town of Blair Gowrie in Perthshire, Scotland, is the home of one such monument, a linear earthwork that is around 1.2 miles in length. To build this monument would have been a major undertaking by our ancestors, and yet today we can only guess at what its function and purpose really was. This is the Cleveland Dyke. For decades I have walked my dogs here. I have run around these woods many hundreds of times and up until recently I was completely unaware that I was literally walking in a Neolithic structure of deeply important historical significance. I had always assumed that this feature was created in recent times as perhaps a firebreak or simply where excess material from a landscaping project had been deposited. So you can imagine my surprise to discover that this feature on the landscape that resides here at the McClure Woods, just outside the town of Blair Gowrie, is in fact around 1.2 miles in length and was built by Neolithic communities around 6,000 years ago. This path that I'm standing on right now is literally right next to this linear earthwork. It's that close that you can walk a few steps off the path and physically climb onto the bank, onto this mysterious structure. Now clearly today it's completely covered in foliage and shrubbery. 6,000 years has certainly had an effect on this place. But it's still quite amazing to stand here where Neolithic people were around 6,000 years ago. Makes you wonder what their thoughts were. What was their motivation? And who were the communities that lived near here in this location? Now, as I was saying a moment ago, from where I am standing, it runs from left to right in both directions. It comprises of two widely spaced parallel ditches with a central bank in the middle, which is what I am standing on right now. Now this continues on through the main wood here at McClure, where it meets the main road from Blair Gowrie to Perth, and then continues on the other side of the road into another section of woodland. In the other direction, it continues through this wood and into what is now a field. Now, unfortunately, at some point in the distant past, the feature was removed to make way for arable farming and all that's left is evidence of crop marks, which are easily seen from the air. It's almost like looking at the ghostly remains of what was once a major statement on the Scottish landscape. Now the two ditches here are approximately 30 to 40 metres apart, and the bank itself is around 5 metres in width and around 2 metres in height. It was once thought by archaeologists to be of Roman construction due to the straightness of the monument, perhaps a defensive structure on the landscape. Now this theory was given further credence because of its close proximity to a known Roman legionary fortress that once existed in this area. This has now been debunked by archaeologists who used aerial photography and ground penetrating radar which confirmed it was constructed long before the Romans arrived on the shores of Britain. 
It is now recognised as a cursus monument from around 4000 BC and therefore built in the Neolithic period by those early farming communities. Now, I've mentioned many times in my historically themed videos that it was Neolithic farmers who built structures such as Stonehenge and the Cleveland Dyke. This is known because these structures require complex communities with resources such as food and an abundance of men and women to be able to create these monuments. They would have had the ability to form organised groups to take on such a project, likely following the sowing of seeds in their fields in the spring and whilst the harvest grew they had time for such an undertaking before the harvest once again was ready to be collected and stored for the hard winter months that would be ahead. Now on the other hand hunter-gatherer groups simply wouldn't have had the luxury of time to take on such a large project because hunter-gatherers are simply doing just that hunting and gathering to survive in what would have been a harsh existence back in antiquity. They lived from day to day foraging and hunting, following the herds of animals as they crossed the land. Now, it's not a matter of intelligence. Hunter-gatherers were fully modern humans who could think just like you and I. It's simply that they did not have the luxury of time needed for what would be a major undertaking that required them to stay in one place for any one period of time. Now, despite parts of the dike being removed in several sections over the centuries, it's believed that there were four deliberate breaks which separated the dike into five separate sections during its construction. Now, what the purpose of these breaks were is up for debate. Perhaps these were access points through the monument. But this is simply conjecture on my part and nobody knows why these breaks were included along the 1.2 mile structure. Now we're going to cross the main road here which runs through the monument and have a look at the structure on the other side. Right, we've just walked about 700 yards and we're nearing the main road here. Now this is where the Cleveland Dyke ends and the main road starts. And on the other side there is where the dike continues. Be very careful if you're crossing this road. It's very busy at all times of day, it seems. But as you can see, oh, tripping over stuff here. There's the main road there. And that direction is coming from Perth or Stanley. So, get across here quick. There we are. And you can perhaps just start to see the dike begins to climb once again over here. There it is. And it continues on down there. I'm not sure how far. It's actually a fair bit clearer on this side than it is over there. It's well overgrown over there. But there it is. Let's get on top here. Yeah, you can't really see for the trees, but it goes on in that direction. And across the main road there. I wonder if the main road was constructed through one of the deliberate breaks I mentioned earlier. It seems more likely to me that part of the structure would have been removed to allow for a path or roadway hundreds if not thousands of years ago and then gradually widened to allow for modern forms of transport access to Perth and beyond. Many modern roads are built upon pre-existing paths and trackways that might have been there for thousands of years. 
and as time went on are simply built upon and enlarged as the need for such access was required for the modern age. Archaeologists believe that there were several long barrows incorporated within the dike. Long barrows were used to place the dead and there is much historical evidence of this happening. However, it appears not all long barrows were used for this purpose and we can only guess as to their use. Now, during my research into this topic, I found no evidence that archaeologists discovered bones here at Cleveland Dyke. But clearly this place was of importance to the Neolithic people who possibly lived and farmed near to this area. As I said earlier, the reason Cleveland Dyke was constructed is unknown but archaeologists speculate that it might have been used for processional purposes. Or perhaps their spiritual beliefs compelled them to construct this monument. It's also believed to have been built in a progressive manner, in that it wasn't built in any one season or year. It appears it might have been built over many years and perhaps each segment gave significance to an event. Perhaps a death or a birth or maybe to commemorate the return of the harvest each year, which would have been a matter of life and death for these communities. Regardless of the broken segments and the number of years taken to construct this monument, it was always meant to be a single monument and the work that was undertaken here was continuous and was an integral part of its meaning and function. The monument is now covered in shrubbery and surrounded by trees. Thousands of years of erosion have taken its toll on this place. But you need only walk along the bank to feel connected with the people who constructed this earthwork. And know that it was your ancestors 6,000 years ago who were here. And they felt compelled to create this magnificent structure. We are left to only imagine its meaning and purpose. And I think in some ways, it only adds to the mystique and wonder of the Cleveland Dyke. <laughs>